few studies I wanted to go into detail, so I'm going to talk about three areas, and it'll be a bit more superficial, but we can then, we have 15 minutes if you have specific questions about uh, some of them. So, um, what I, the change agenda is, I want to talk about market segmentation briefly, because that's specifically what Tiffany was interested in, and the importance or the value of market segmentation in the area of environmental sustainability. Uh, eye tracking, we've done a few eye tracking studies recently, which are also related to uh, environmental behaviors or non-behaviors, as you will see, so I'll briefly report about those. And that was the one I came to talk to you about. Uh, that's what I'm really fired up about. So that's experimental studies where we're trying to get people, not motivate, not convince, but literally get them, nudge them if you want to behave a little bit more environmentally friendly. All right, Mike, and you see there's different people involved, so I just made a separate slide for all these people. Um, market segmentation is really a methodology that's independent of whether it's humans or uh, 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 bio a species of animals or whatever you want. What it basically does is it groups similar entities of whatever, right? In our case, because we are interested in business, it's similar consumers. We're trying to find similar consumers for specific purposes. Usually what we want to do is we want to communicate product offers in different ways to increase our sales, for example, right? But we can use that same method to learn about differences in, in people with respect to their pro-environmental behavior or their attitudes that may affect how we try to influence their pro-environmental behaviors. So what you see here is just one example. So what we, what we have here is a very large number of pro-environmental behaviors, right? Recycling newspaper, can switching off lights, and so on. And so we asked, in this particular case, we asked people to tell us which of these behaviors they engage in on vacation and at home, right? And then we tried to identify patterns. So these are, if you want, the dimensions of my data set, and that's an R printout, so whoever is in the R session could have stayed here. We're doing all of this in R as well. Uh, and what you see here is we have six segments, and the bars describe what the segment profile is. And the little dots here with the lines tell us what the total sample uh, average is. Yeah? So if we want to understand what segment one stands for, we can see the bar is higher, except for littering, which is a negative item, yes. Uh, everything is above average. So these are the super pro-environmental behavior people, or they're liars, they could be, yeah, because this is survey-based. And here we have a segment of people who do absolutely nothing. And then we have interesting ones, like this one, they're the composters, right? So they not, do nothing else but compost. <laughs> and you can see that they're probably, they're probably king gardeners, right? It probably has nothing to do with the environment at all. But what we find here is we can find systematic patterns of, of similar people, right? And if these patterns are valid, and I will take the liberty to speak about validity for a second, then we as policymakers or we as influencers in any role, right, can realize that we need to talk to composters differently, right? then we need to talk to those people or those people. Yeah? So that's the value of understanding that markets are not homogenous, but that there is distinct and systematic differences, and we can use them, harvest them, to improve uh, our communication or our interventions. So briefly about segmentation. The reason I'm doing this is not because I want to do a method seminar, but I want to show you because it's so tempting. You can go in SPSS or in R for that matter and quickly do that, but there's real danger. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about this. So this is a two-dimensional data set of consumers, right? Now just uh, to go back here, this is a one, two, three, four, five, let's say 25-dimensional data set. Yeah? So these are the dimensions of our data set. So what I'm showing is a super simple example. So imagine we just have recycled newspapers and recycled cans. And then that's my consumers, right? Recycle newspaper, yes, no recycle cans, they extend. So if we want to segment this, the method is very trivial. The actual grouping uh, method based on similarities is very simple. We decide for, this is k-means, there's different algorithm. That's a really simple one. We choose two starting points, let's say the red one and the blue one. And what we do is we take one of our consumers and we measure the distance. Are they closer to the red one or the blue one, right? And they're closer to the... Yes, yeah. <laughs> good participation, yes. So we're going to put the red one to the red one, yeah? And then we're going to take the next consumer, red or blue? Red. Still red, excellent. And we go every single one, blue, right? Good, and we go, go, go until the whole data set is allocated. And now we see we have a small market segment of red consumers and a gigantic market segment of blue consumers. And we also see that this is this blue person, a good representative of the blue segment? 
not good at all. Why? Because they are at the edge of the segment, right? They are not representative of this person at all. So what we do is we push them in the middle, so they become good representatives. And in the next step, now these become the representatives and we do the whole process of computing distances again. So you see the mathematical process is super trivial, really, right? But the problem is, if you have a data set like that, you can already see what the problem is. If I start with the blue and the red, it's quite different than starting with the blue and the green. Do you see why? Because the starting points affect how we're going to group. And how we group affects the profile that we've just looked at. Yeah? So, so I, I'm totally into market segmentation. Right? I've done it for 20 years. I love it. But it's quite dangerous in terms of potentially misinterpreting. Because you're going to push, you're going to take data, you're going to analyze it, and you will always get a result. But it's not clear that that's a valid or the best possible result. So if you look at these data situations here, this is what we, in a textbook on market segmentation, that's what you see. Yeah? Dumplings in space, which are beautifully separated and the perfect market segments. Well, I've been 20 years of segmenting markets, I've never ever come across that situation, right? This is what I usually come across, a huge mess where consumers come in all shades of gray, right? And what I need to do here is actually not find segments, but create them, yeah? If I'm lucky, I find a situation like that. That's still no clear market segments, but at least there's a bit of structure in the data that helps me uh, uh, work. So if we do re one simple way to find out if I'm in this situation or this is to do many, many repeated analysis. And that's where R comes in, right? Because you don't want to do 500 in SPSS. You want to just do it in R where it just goes automatically and you have a look how often you get the same result. So you see, if I do this 500 times, I will always find two segments, no drama at all, yeah? If I do this 500 times with three market segments, then I will get a pretty stable solution, despite the fact that technically these are not segments, right? Because they're going into one another. Yeah? In the case which I told you is the most frequent case, it's not so nice. In this case, you see, if I went for three segments, I would get something like this. And every time I would do it, it can change entirely. Okay? So I think when we talk market segmentation, there's huge value in market segmentation. But we need to be very aware that the, the, it's an exploratory method, right? It's not like adding where two and two is always four. So we need to be really smart in how to make sure that we have valid market segments. And another one I snuck in just because we talked about sample size. I hear you have lots of large survey data sets, which is fabulous if you want to segment. And it really does matter that you have a su su sufficient sample size. So if you look just at this chart here, right, again, it's two-dimensional market segmentation problem. And if I were to ask you how many market segments in here, what would you say? Six. Six is, is as good a guess as two, five, three, or anything else, yeah? So it could be anything because we don't have enough data. This is artificially generated data out of this data. You see, when I add more, I can see what's going on. But if it's not enough sample, I can't. And the same happens with algorithms. So if you have something like this, where we have 25, or, oh no, I have to go too far back, I'm not going back, back that far. If I have 25 variables, yeah, and I give the algorithm 100 respondents on 25 algorithms, that's pretty much this. Yeah, the algorithm has no chance on earth to find anything reasonable. But will the algorithm tell you, no, it will not. It will just give you some solution, and you will happily interpret it, and that's potentially, uh, uh, it's not optimal. So yeah, sample size, uh, we basically looked at how we can improve the segmentation result with artificial data, where we know the true nature of segments. And initially we came to about 60, 70, but then we built into the simulation typical problems we have with sur survey data, like response styles and fatigue and all these things. And really now we would recommend 100 people per variable, right? So if you have uh, 10 variables in your data set, you'd want 10 times 100 respondents to be relatively safe that you can see that. All right, sorry, that was just my little excursion, but here's another example that was out of our uh, wa recycled water study. And to show you why I think it has potential in terms of policy, in terms of many things. So what we have here is we have looked at people's acceptance of recycled and desalinated water. That was many years ago. Uh, and you can see we asked them for a number of different uses, would you use recycled or desalinated water? And you can see here the overall uh, sample frequency. But once we looked for segments, once we looked at patterns in this, it became quite clear that there were very distinct people. 
Some of them were kind of general strong acceptors. They were just quite open-minded about everything. Yeah. Then we have recycling acceptors. So there were people who were actually quite passionate about adopting recycling, but rejected desalination heavily. And then we had the desalination acceptors, where they were all about desal and hated recycling. Yeah. Why? It was quite interesting. These are the people who say, oh, the ocean is blue and clean and I love to swim in the ocean and I love to surf, so that's got to be a good thing. And recycling is terrible, right? That's the toilet to tap thing. So that's kind of the mindset that's sounding behind here. And the mindset behind here is it's environmentally friendly. Recycling solves so many problems, not just freshwater problems. And this cell is environmentally unfriendly, right? Because it discharges brine into the ocean and uses huge amounts of energy. And what is so nice about this example, and that rarely happens, I will admit that, is that these segments aligned beautifully with media usage, right? So these guys here watch state TV, ABC, SBS. These guys here watch commercial TV. These guys watch state TV and read newspapers. Now that is a segmenter's dream, right? Because suddenly you see not only the nature of what you communicate to these people has to be different, but the avenue by which you communicate these things has to be totally different, right? So that's my little excursion into market segmentation for your benefit, <laughs> Tiffany. I hope uh, uh, that uh, was interesting. But I see a lot of potential for that, right? Because whatever we do afterwards, whether we use communication messages or interventions, it is important to understand heterogeneity among the people whose, whose uh, behavior we would like to influence. All right. Eye tracking, that was another one we snuck in today. And where did that come from? Well, it comes from the fact that we are all in tourism, right? But we, we do other stuff as well, but we, are, we like tourism. So we do a lot of stuff in tourism. Now, tourism is a pretty filthy industry, right? Uh, huge uh, CO2 emissions, especially out of air travel, but not only air travel. Accommodation is a huge uh, polluter and food. Food waste is a big problem in tourism and hospitality. So we said, all right, well, let's have a look. What do people usually do to change these behaviors? And what do we usually do? Well, you know it from your own hotel visits. You come in the hotel and they will give you this big story about recycling towels and how this is good for the environment and how you should do it. And, all. and what do you do? You push it to the side and move on with life, right? Very few people actually act upon these communications. How do we develop these communications? Well, we take theories, different theories of human behavior, and we basically use these theories to then develop communication. So, for example, if we know that beliefs right, affect, if we believe that beliefs affect our behavior, then we can go and target beliefs. We can try to communicate to people uh, beliefs and we then assume, or we could do it via social norms, right? We could say 99% of all guests in this hotel recycle, reuse their towels, yeah? putting social pressure on them. Or we use perceived behavior control and we say, it's so easy, why wouldn't you do it? There's nothing keeping you from doing this. So we use theoretical constructs which we believe are associated with behavior and we try to communicate to change these constructs in the hope that we're going to change behavior. Right? And so what Nazila does is mainly Nazila, my PhD students work that you see now that I thought I'd present it to you. So we basically have these theories of pro-environmental behavior or human behavior in general. We develop communication messages based on these theories, right? And then we expect that that's going to change behavior. Now, to prove that it changed behavior, there's only one thing to do, right? We can do an experiment. Yeah? We agree that a survey is not going to help. If we want to measure behavior, we must do an experiment on observed behavior. That's the only way to find out. Now, that's pretty labor intensive, right? So most people shy away from doing that because that's, that's a big task. So what you could do then in between is you could say, well, actually, Unless people look at my communications, there's no chance they can ever act upon it, right? And actually to test this is a lot easier than to test this. And that's where Nazila's thesis came in. She said, all right, well, I want to have a look what people actually pay attention to. Because if they pay attention, okay, then I still need to do the experiment, right? But if they don't pay attention, well, then we know this communication is not going to work and it's just a waste of the paper it's printed on. So we looked at three behaviors, and I'll talk to you through all of them. One is about carbon offsetting. So that's a collaborative linkage grant with Qantas and the Carbon Emissions Institute. I forgot what the exact title is. Now, Qantas is actually quite committed to, to, to the carbon offsetting. They collect it. They do not take a, a, a cut out of this. It goes straight to the Carbon Institute. And, but they're very frustrated because 
pretty much nobody, nobody buys, right? It's about 10% people who engage in carbon offsetting. So they wanted to know what can we do, how can we change things to improve carbon offsetting. Now this, what you see behind the blue dots, is exactly the booking page on Qantas, right? You can vaguely see some Qantas flight numbers. And we asked people to basically book their flight in our eye tracking lab, and then we looked at what they look at. And what you see here is their eye movements. Big fat means for a long time looked at, right? White space means not looked at all, right? Now let's have a look at our carbon message that's in here. Not looked at at all, right? So we, had a, we wasted a bit of time changing the message, and we were very sad, nothing changed. Well, it's not surprising. People basically see carbon neutral jump straight away, right? So basically, that's an important insight, because it tells Qantas, it doesn't matter what that sentence is, right? Absolutely does not matter, because people just don't look at it at all. So as a consequence, what we've done, and I won't talk about that because we'll run out of time, is we're now investigating. We already know pictures are better. We know really short text is better. So we have this ridiculously small amount of space, right, on the screen. And we need to do something with it that's going to grab attention, because unless we get their attention, they're not going to purchase. They're just going to keep jumping over it. Yeah? All right, the second example is holiday home booking. That was a bit Airbnb inspired. So we gave them different holiday homes to look at, and we gave them only a subsection of what Airbnb. Airbnb has 56 criteria you can inspect, right? I don't know who has the capacity to do that, but anyway. So we gave them a, a, a selection of these and a few pictures. And we snuck in environment here, and we snuck in community here. That was kind of the donations to charities and things like that. And, well, you can already see the picture, right? So first, they, they look quite a lot for the first hotel or accommodation because they need to figure out what's going on. Yeah? And then as they process through the task, they just focus on what matters to them, and environment and community is not up there. Yeah? In fact, the only thing we could, could do to, to push up the attention to environment and uh, community in a setup like this is to reduce. So we had a second experimental condition with a smaller number of criteria. And that's where we get them to click. But if it's such a realistic, this is even less than realistic. This is less information than you see on a normal booking page. Uh, they really don't uh, pay attention, unfortunately, to those aspects. So again, very unlikely it's going to affect choice, right, if we're not looking at it. And the third one is in pro progress. We haven't finished that yet. So what we're doing here is where it's about food choice, right? And we've calculated the CO2 emissions for each one of those burgers. And um, then we've uh, basically let them choose their burger. It was burgers, drink, drinks, and desserts. And yeah, you can see the same thing again. So we have the first burger, which we inspect in a lot of detail, right? And then that's pretty much it. This icon is, oh, once looked at, but really not looked at anymore, right? And mainly it's the titles, the pictures, and the bacon that matters, right? <laughs> not the CO2 emissions. So, uh, so yeah, it's a bit of a... Um, you know, frustrating point now for me and Nazila because we've just shown a problem that's never satisfying in research. Uh, but, but I mean, we have ideas how we can uh, now run new series, right? Where we can either have stimuli that are more attention seeking or where we need to rethink it, where we just need to admit putting this in here has zero effect in a pleasure seeking context, right? So maybe we need to have totally different approaches where uh, we position things differently in a menu or uh, uh, things like that. All right, I think that's my eye tracking, isn't it? Yes, and now is what I'm really excited. I mean, I'm excited about all of it, but this I'm excited about, you know why? Because it's actually, I've done 20 years of research, mostly survey-based, and I have to honestly tell you I'm over it, right? I'm over it because all the things that really interest me, people will not give me the truthful answer, yeah? So that's why I'm excited, because here I go and I measure behavior, and I don't really care about what they tell me, and I know that something has worked or it hasn't, because I've measured the behavior. Yeah? So the way it started is that we thought oh, all tourists are angels, right? And they're going to do the right thing, because I do the right thing. So why wouldn't they do the right thing? And then we had a series of disappointments. The first disappointment was a study my PhD student Logi did in Iceland. He went to uh, the ticketing offices for two whale watching tours which are identical, absolutely identical, except that one is eco-certified and the other one is not. So after they bought the tickets, he asked them a bunch of survey questions, but that was in the waiting area. So they, that was away from the ticket office. They couldn't see 
any product information. And he asked, did you consider the environment when you make your booking decisions? And they're all angels, right? So 60% tell us, yes, absolutely, of course, what else would we consider but the environment? Because after all, the boats are identical. So then we went on the boats, but I didn't. Logie hopped on the boat. And he had a look at how many people knew it was eco-certified. Now, that's not a behavior, but it's a knowledge question, right? An attitudinal question, you can tell me anything, and I can never know if it's right or wrong. But with a knowledge question, I know if it's right or wrong. So I know the boat is not eco-certified. And you can see close to 90% didn't have an idea at all, and 8% believed incorrectly it was eco-certified. And on this boat, where we're hoping that all the tree-hugging hippies are sitting, right? <laughs> the picture is not much more positive, so 75% were unaware, and 23% of this boat, but that's 12% of all of our tourists, uh, was, were actually able to give us the correct answer. So that's pretty depressing, right? Because most in the tourism literature, the vast majority of studies is survey-based, and there's overwhelming agreement that tourists love the environment and would do anything to, uh, you know, to sacrifice their uh, vacation enjoyment for the environment. Yeah, we see that that's not necessarily the case. Uh, another PhD student of mine, Emil, went and talked to environmental volunteers. Because we thought, well, surely, somewhere there's got to be people who are actually doing the right thing. So we approached Greenpeace and a number of organizations and asked, could we contact your members? So he went and interviewed them super open-ended, right? The exact opposite of your very structured survey. And he basically said, tell me about your last vacation. And we were just listening whether any of them would, would give us anything remotely associated with pro-environmental behavior. And pretty much nobody, one single person managed, mentioned anything nobody else did. Emil then prompted them and said, you know, started talking. And immediately people knew, they knew exactly the environmental consequences of their vacation. They felt guilty and they expressed their guilt. And then this amazing world of excuses came out, right? <laughs> and it's really remarkable. So we have a whole typology of excuses here, right? <laughs> so who me? You know, no, my actions don't do anything. Oh, it's not that bad. Uh, it can all be fixed. Uh, I could behave even more badly, right? So I compare myself with myself. I could be a bigger vandal, but I'm actually quite all right. Uh, others are, look at that guy, look at that guy. <laughs> all one-way containers, not me. Other industries, yeah, sure, tourism is bad, but look at mining, look at manufacturing. So, and it just goes on and on. I don't have enough time, I'm not rich enough, these things are too expensive, it just goes on and on. And these are kind of the people who, in their everyday life, are super committed, right? These are the people who run around with the keep cups and don't take one big cups. But when they're on vacation, it's like a different world, right? They suddenly, the, the whole uh, operating system changes. This one you've already seen. Remember, that was our segmentation study. Now, the only reason I'm mentioning it again, because remember, we asked them, how do you behave at home and how do you behave on vacation? And guess what? The biggest migration of people is from this one to this one. Right? So we just see this massive shift where there is a drop in every single behavior that's pro-environmental. Yeah? And why? Well, the same thing. Well, at home it's my place, I spend more time there, I feel responsible, I'm more in control, I've got the infrastructure, all sorts of explanations. But the reality is, they go on vacation, that's their special time. Right? And, and if, if, if it, that is the context where it's, it doesn't get any harder than convincing people or making people behave environmentally friendly, then on vacation, right? Because that's their special time where they just let go of all their responsibilities and want to enjoy. All right, and then we went into experiments, and that was my most expensive uh, failure of my career, yeah? So what we did is we went full of enthusiasm into a hotel with 100 rooms, and we installed water meters, and we installed electrometers, and we counted towels, right? And we said, we're going to do this better than anyone else. And we designed stickers. They had to be stickers because the, the hotel gets people from different cultural... So it's in Europe, right? So basically, 20 kilometers this way, people speak Croatian. 20 kilometers this way, they speak Slovenian, Russian. Yeah, so we need to have non-verbal stickers. But what we did is we had different stickers for water, electricity, and towels. But we stuck them exactly where the behavior occurs, right? So it wasn't <laughs> just the one sign about towels. But every switch for any electricity use had a sticker. Yeah? And we thought, surely, you know, like we can't prompt them anymore. 
directly. And we had different ones. Uh, you know, this one was supposed to be fun, but turns out it went horribly wrong in the manipulation check because people felt they were told they're a pig, right? So that was not the most glamorous experimental condition. <laughs> Uh, so we basically had three conditions, again, theory-driven. One was specifically trying to impose gait, and that worked quite well, actually. One was just a reminder. This one was meant to be fun, but it wasn't so much. All right, and then we have our R printout again, and what do you see? We've got experimental condition nothing, experimental condition fun, experimental condition gait, experimental condition fact. What would you see? Absolutely nothing, because we went through all this effort, and there was absolutely nothing. So that's, that's where really the point came, where we said, we can't, it looks like we just can't convince people, right? Maybe that's the mistake. Maybe when they're in this highly hedonic context, where it's all about pleasure, we just cannot go and try to convince them to be good boys and girls. And that's where we started looking at nudging, right? I'm sure you're familiar with nudging theory, and this is not our work, I have to be very clear, but this is one of my all-time favorite studies. So what this guy did is they, they went to 52 Finnish hotels and they looked at food waste, right? And they said, how can we reduce food waste? Well, one thing would be to convince people about their environmental uh, disadvantages, but they didn't, they didn't try that. They tried two things. One is they simply reduced the plate by three centimeters, 20% less food waste. Yeah? I mean, isn't that amazing? No arguing, no describing, no talking to them, just reduce the plate size and they just do automatically what you want them to do. And the second thing they did, which is a little bit more attitudinal, but goes actually at, at something they identified, which is the embarrassment of returning. Yeah? So again, this is no idealism about environment. But they talked to people at the breakfast buffet, and they found that people are embarrassed to go back. So instead of going five times, they go once, pile up that massive plate, right? And then leave a huge amount behind. So what they said is they said that was a table sign, and they said, go again and again, go as many times. So they tried to counteract that sense of embarrassment. Yeah? And again, that was quite successful. Yeah? And none of these things are trying to alter beliefs, right? which is the primary avenue we try to communicate and convince people to change their behavior. So that was uh, very inspiring to us. So we did our own little studies. And this one we haven't. This is a hard one. So if anyone has interest or good ideas, this is the one I'm stuck on. So we also wanted to attack the food waste problem, and we, we found very interesting systematic patterns. So this is in a Slovenian hotel. First of all, you see, you know, everyone in this hotel wastes about a bowl of cornflakes, worth of cornflakes per day. That's a huge amount of, uh, I mean, food waste is a huge environmental problem, right? But if you think of how many billions of tourists travel every year, this is a problem. And, but what we also see is we see some patterns. Now that's specific to the hotel, right? We can see that the Germans and Austrians are very well behaved. Yeah, they don't waste anything. They measure it, eat it, go. <laughs> Russians? No, Russians pile up the plate and go. Now, now that's this specific context. I'm not generalizing for nationalities. But it is interesting uh, to see that there is that systematic, that's not random, that's tested. The Germans aren't, they're white. But these ones are significantly different. And what we see here is younger guests, that's linked with families. So families, total disaster, not surprising, right? Anyone who's got kids and lets them loose at the buffet knows exactly what happens. And this one's interesting, three buffets. And here we have a theory, but we can't prove it yet. What we think is happening is that people have this perception of abundance, right? So what the hotel does is as the number of guests grows, they add more buffet islands. And, uh, but we correct it for the number of humans. Right? But just the fact that more food was visible on display reduced the amount of food waste. So those are the things we would like to experiment with. We would like to see if we can prevent them from seeing all the food. Right? So they can still go and get as much as they want, but it's not so much in their face. So there's a number of things we, uh, uh, we can still try. But at this, at this stage we've tried a few, like music. Music was linked to faster eating in restaurants. Right? So restaurants give fast music so that you eat and go quickly, right? Not slow music, because then the guests would relax too much and they would uh, block the space for the next people who can earn money. So we tried that, we couldn't make it work. So this is a tricky one, but this is one uh, we really want to tackle kind of in the next, um, uh, next few years. So if anyone has ideas, I'd be very happy to hear that. This is room cleaning. Now, what we did here is we said, 
instead of just, and that's not new, many hotels do that, right? They say you can waive the room claim. So what we did here, and that's another test for the fact that this attitudinal approach is not working. We said, all right, uh, you can optionally tell us not to clean your room. For every day when you tell us don't clean the room, we will give you a drinks voucher. Now that's a really good model, right, for the hotel. Why? Because the drinks voucher might be worth five bucks for me, but it's only costing them two bucks at the restaurant, right? Because they buy at cost, but I pay price. So it's a good model where it's a win-win for the, because you need to get the hotel on board. You can't suggest something that's going to cost the hotel extra money. And you can't suggest something that's going to be a, 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 a loss in pleasure or, or enjoyment for the tourists. Yeah? So basically we say, you uh, wave and you get a free drinks voucher. That was one condition. The second condition was we were telling them about the environmental benefits and the whole spiel and there was no consequence, right? They could just be angels by waving the cane. And then we had a third condition where they got the voucher and they got the full environmental explanation of the consequences of a room cane. And uh, you see the consequences here, that's quite a lot, right? Like if you think about one hotel room clean, uh, that's a huge amount of water, electricity and chemicals for one single room clean. And talking to the hotel, you know, some cleaners literally go in and open the water. And while they're vacuum cleaning, the water's running down the drain. So, so this is really something where you can have impact if you can get people uh, to wave it. And what did we? I, Forty-two percent less room cleans. For which condition do you think? Because I didn't put it in, or did I? Which one? The drinks. What about the drinks plus environment? Nothing. Nothing is that frustrating, right? Because you would think at least if you give them the drink and the feeling of being an angel. It would kind of double boost it? No, zero effect. So uh, environmental information alone, no significant difference. Drinks vouchers, massive difference. Drinks vouchers plus environmental information, nothing. Yeah? So again, confirmation that this cognitive avenue in this particular context, which is all about pleasure, uh, is not particularly effective. All right, and that's the last one we've done, which was, a, that was actually really funny because it came out of our debrief with the same hotel. We wanted to tell the staff what we found because they, they were quite involved in the whole experiment. And so we asked them, is there anything else we could, we could check? And the food and beverage manager said serviettes. And we said, we said well, what's with serviettes? Like we just totally didn't get what the problem is with serviettes. And he said, well, look, we have these massive cotton serviettes, thick cotton serviettes. The moment the guest touches it, I have to wash it and iron it. Every time we wash it and iron it, it's water, it's chemicals, it's electricity. And then we don't use them forever, right? We use them about 70 times, then we throw them out. So we said, all right, but that's actually a really good case for what we call changing the default. Yeah, you might have heard about that. The most family, famous example of default is organ donorship. So if you tell your population that they can opt into organ donorship, nobody opts in, right? If you tell them in our country organ donorship is the norm, but you can't opt out, everyone's an organ donor. Right? So it's about the default. What, what happens if you make no decision? Yeah? So what we've done is we basically went and we well, first we did a lot of calculations and found out that that cotton serviette indeed is worse. Not even just in the washing and cleaning, but the production of cotton is very water intensive. And it's a bit, you probably know this better than I. There's nobody's going to give you an exact number, right? But to the best of our calculations, it's actually a lot better to use a recycled paper serviette than a cotton serviette that's used about seven, seven, uh, 70 times. And we did a very, very simple experiment. We went back to the same hotel and we, in the first condition for a month, it was all over summer, so this, the period, the, the, the tourist season was the same in nature. And in the first month, it was the usual operation mode, the serviette waits on you on the table, yeah, and you just use the cotton serviette. In the second one, we put the uh, recycled serviette on the table, but we still had cotton serviettes at the buffet, right? Because here again, see the problem is we want to change the tourist behavior. But unless the hotel manager's on board, it's not going to happen, right? So here, what, what's the hotel manager's biggest fear? These people pay four star prices. He doesn't want to disappoint these guests, right? And never come back. So we still had the same uh, serviettes at the buffet, but they were, they were not the default, right? And just that simple change led to a 95% reduction in the cotton serviettes used. And here I had, I had to do a survey because I had to find out how they felt about it as much as I don't like surveys. 
And it was quite interesting because for both conditions, the recall was equally good or bad, what kind of serviette they had. We wanted to know, did they even, did they even realize what serviette they were using? Yeah? And then we asked them, how satisfied were you? And this, this difference is only because one single person didn't like the recycled serviette. Right? So really, the survey results and all the comments they had with the staff was nobody cares what kind of survey they get, right? But for us, it makes a big difference uh, uh, environmentally. So changing the default here proved like a very simple uh, solution that doesn't cost the hotel more and doesn't actually affect people's holiday enjoyment uh, uh, by changing that. All right. Oh, that's just, uh, yeah. What we think is interesting about this is two things. First of all, now you're not so much into the tourism literature, but really we've been talking for, about sustainable tourism for a good 30 years now, right? And there's hardly any tangible recommendations what to do, except for everyone saying that the government should change something and that the businesses should self-regulate, but that never happens, right? So, so, so these are actually small but tangible approaches on how uh, we can maybe move forward. And the other thing we feel is, is really here happening is that I'm not arguing that the theory of planned behavior or this is the Stern's theory of environmentally significant behavior does not work. In fact, it works very well in the home context. There's been a lot of experiments that show that appealing at beliefs works in the home context. But we have absolutely no evidence that it works in tourism because tourism is highly pleasure oriented and it seems to just throw all of this overboard. People just let go and they, it's not in line with their values, right? But they don't care. They give themselves permission to not act in line with their values and their beliefs. So in this particular context, we feel that nudging theory is much more the way forward than the attempt to change beliefs, social or appeal <coughs> social norms or uh, um, uh, perceived behavior control. Oh, that's the end of it. Uh, there you go. 45 minutes exactly, Tiffany. So we have 15 minutes. If you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them or talk to you.